Thanks, Patricia. Uh, just a quick introduction. So Sean Brenneman, I'm your local territory rep with Syngenta. Uh, I cover Lambton, Middlesex, and Elgin counties, uh, basically London to Sarnia. I I've been with Syngenta for 15 years uh, next month and in ag retail 10 years before that. So my wife and I live just north of the big metropolis of Alvinston, uh, Ontario. And if you ever want to get together and talk about products or farming in general, uh, Armour's Ale House, Riverstone Pizzeria, and uh, Stone Pickers are some of my favorite hangout spots there. So reach out anytime. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I, I always like to start with this slide, any grower meeting I'm at, because this really shows the, the breadth of our Hort portfolio. And if you ever bought any of these products, which I'm sure a lot of you have brought, bought uh, some of these products, thank you very much. We, we really appreciate your business. We know there's a lot of choice in the market and uh, we wanna thank you for allowing Syngenta to be part of your, your business and a partner in your production plan. Um, believe it or not, I don't bring all these products and solutions to market myself. There's a pretty big team behind me and this is a, just a quick map of the rest of the resources we have available. So on the left side of the, the map there, those are all the other territory reps that I would work in conjunction with. So if you've got a burning question, a production question, if I don't have the answer, I can reach out to some of that group who might work down in Chatham, Kent, Essex, or up in the Bradford Marsh. We, we have a, a really good partnership and team atmosphere that we, we learn from each other and can, uh, can really understand and help growers right across the, the, the county, uh, right across the province together. And then also with that, there's a huge marketing team that keeps me supplied with things like hats and gloves and knives and cool things like that. They also pull together uh, our quick reference guides. So each of you on the call today will get our hort, our vegetable guide, but then we've also got cucurbit guides, melons, uh, blueberries, apples, row crop for corn, soybeans, wheat, there's a, there's a pile there. So if everybody here will get a uh, fruiting veg and uh, cucurbit guide, but if there's other resource guides that I can send you, please reach out to the Lakeside team or myself personally, and we'll make sure you'll get one in the mail. Uh, beyond that too, the other resource, uh, when I have the, the biggest resource I have available is really the presenter that's gonna be going next. And that's Patricia Clofer, who's the Hort Specialist for Southwestern Ontario. And she is my go-to for those really tough burning technical questions. And uh, with that, Patricia, take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Sean. As Sean mentioned, we're part of a team. And a year ago, I was the lone wolf, if you will, on the horticulture team. And then we hired a technical rep. Her name is Jennifer Foster. And she's been here in Ontario with us and is my helper when I have tough questions from you folks um, that I go to. And then um, just in December, we now have a whole horticulture team at Syngenta. So we have a bit of a business head, we have a marketing person specifically for horticulture. Um, I'm, we have Jen, like I mentioned, our tech person, and then there's myself and also now Eric Phillips that are working as salespeople and horticulture specialists in Ontario. So pretty exciting. Uh, my job title's changed a little bit again, but very excited to be able to share um, some of the space and time in Ontario with another horticulture specialist. So if all goes according to plan and if COVID allows, um, probably you'll see a little bit more and hear a little bit more from me and Sean, just as the territories are a bit smaller and we're able to interact with you a little bit more. So for today, the time that we have, we're going to spend it on three main things. Um, the first is adepinin, which is a brand new molecule that we brought to the market. <coughs> excuse me, a year ago, we had limited product available and unlimited crops and that's changed. So we'll talk about how that, what's special about it, how you could use it on your farm in a product called Miravis Duo. And then we'll talk about what Miravis Duo brings when it comes to crop quality and sustainable management. So you may have heard if you grow corn or wheat, or even if you were around about a year ago, we have a new brand called Miravis. Miravis is pretty special. Um, it's a brand family. So that means there's five products that start with Miravis. It's pretty confusing for growers, for retails, even sometimes for Sean and I, 
but two of them are specifically for horticulture. We'll dwell on the one today called Miravis Duo, and that's primarily for vegetables. And then we do have a perennial fruit product um, and for lettuce as well called Miravis Prime. But just for sake of time today, we're going to talk about Miravis Duo. All five of those brands that I just mentioned that we have under the Miravis umbrella are powered by this adepidin molecule. So you can see the molecule here on the screen in front of us. And there's three special pieces about this. Syngenta actually engineered this molecule, which means they built it and put it together specifically for growers. The first piece of the molecule is on the left-hand side. We call that the power piece. And there's a bit of a blue bubble behind it, if you can see that. And that's classic for an SDHI chemistry. So for any group seven, they all have that piece of the molecule to them. That's what gives us some of the power, the potency that we've seen with all group sevens, especially as we continue to, develop, to develop them as an industry. The stamina piece is the next important piece about Miravis or the adepidin molecule. That's the piece on the right hand side there with the purple splash behind it. The important part about that part of our molecule with adepidin is that it binds very tightly to the wax layer. I'll show you a graph here in a second, a demonstration of what exactly that means, but that also the reason it binds tightly to the wax is also why we have residual control of many diseases with this product. That piece is very important when it comes to diseases that we're dealing with a lot on our leaves, like leaf spots, powdery mildews, that sort of thing. The middle piece of the molecule is what we consider the most special piece at Syngenta. It's called our spectrum piece. Specifically, it's this N-methoxy group. So that's the N with the little O underneath of it. And that's what gives us the spectrum of control that we see with the Depidin products. It allows us to get control of things like powdery mildew, early blight or alternaria, and also tougher diseases we can control too, like botrytis, white mold, and fusarium, depending on the rate we're going with and what product we're working with. So all together, we consider this a bit like our smartphone at Syngenta, where we've put three things together, almost like your phone, your computer, and your camera, in one easy to use tool that we hope farmers can use on a regular basis. I mentioned that this is very broad spectrum, and this is just another little piece of the puzzle here on what we're seeing. So powdery mildew, very strong on powdery mildew, especially when it comes to cucurbits. When it comes to leaf spots like alternaria or stemphilium or septoria, we're seeing actual excellent control of those diseases as well, keeping those leaves healthy and green and photosynthesizing longer. Lastly, when we go at a high rate of adepidin, and that again depends a bit on the product, we can control diseases such as botrytis, white mold, gummy stem blight, and fusarium. So how does this adepidin piece work with it binding to the wax layer? So when we spray our plant, I should mention this is a cross section of a leaf. So if you had a leaf and chopped it and looked at the side, this is what you'd see. When we spray adepidin or a Miravis brand product, we try to get the best coverage we can on the leaf. So this number one dark blue bar is us spraying the actual product itself. We do see that it sticks well to the surface of the leaf and very, very quickly it moves into the wax layer. So this wax layer is kind of like the outer layer of the leaf, if you will. And you'll remember that purple piece of the molecule, it binds in there. And the wax layer almost acts like a rain barrel. It collects a lot of the adepidin. And then over time, the adepidin moves slowly into the rest of the leaf. This is what gives us control, not only at the surface of the leaf from things trying to penetrate the leaf, but also from the inside of the leaf as well. We do see xylem activity or movement with this product as well. It is quite slow, um, which is why we really want to make sure when we're using Miravis brand products or the adepidin molecule that we want to go early before the disease is there. So again, some of the benefits to using a product, some of the features when we're using a product that binds tightly to the wax layers that we see excellent rain fastness. Um, all of our data the quickest we can get it to rain or simulated rain is an hour and we know that we have very good rain fastness in that time. We see long lasting control because it does move into that wax layer and it stays there for a long time to give us potent protection of things trying to penetrate our leaf. 
and it is the broadest spectrum SDHI on the market at this time, controlling something like Fusarium, and it's the first group seven to really do a good job for that across multiple species. And we're seeing other control of simpler diseases like powdery mildew or early blight as well. So Miravis Duo itself, what exactly is this product and how are we going to use it? Miravis Duo is a combination. So it's this adepidin molecule I just spent a few minutes talking about mixed with diphenaconazole. So that's a group three that you've seen in some of our other products like Aprovia Top or Quadris Top. And we've put those two products together in order to bring you broad spectrum control of various diseases. And the cool part about it is that they actually overlap on a number of diseases such as early blight, powdery mildew, just to name a couple. So it's almost built, it is built in resistance management on quite a few of the diseases that we're trying to target across different crops. You can see this is our label, tried to simplify it as well as we could, but Miravis Dew is registered across a whole host of different crops, multiple different diseases on it, again, from the alternaria to anthracnose, a little bit cercospora to botrytis. The one thing that we tried to keep as simple as possible for people is regardless of what crop you're working in or which Miravis you're working with, the most common rate that we're using is 0.4 liters per acre. So 400 mils with your Miravis product gets you control of a wide range of different things. Crop quality. How does Miravis Duo help us protect crop quality? As a chemical company, sometimes we think that we have the next best thing that's going to help your crop. And quite often we can do that. But the whole part about crop quality actually starts well before you're in the sprayer in season. It starts with the cultural and soil management that you choose to do on your farm. Things like site selection, raised beds, rotation, making sure your equipment's clean going from one crop to the next if you see a disease start to pop up. Those are all very important things and things that maybe take a bit of time, but usually have the biggest impact on crop quality if you have the right opportunity to do so. That's why it's the base of the crop quality pyramid. The next piece of the pyramid is our seed selection. Things like what seed treatment are you using? What variety are you planting or hoping to grow? Is it tolerant to different diseases that we're dealing with in the field? How do our transplants look when we're planting them? That's the second piece that is the next biggest piece of the crop quality puzzle. The last piece, the piece that sometimes gets talked about the most is the crop protection piece. So this is our in season, what can we do to get the crop through and get the most bang for our buck once we're at the point where fruit is starting to develop and we have plants growing in the field. Choosing the right products is very important, but sometimes if we're trying to correct a problem from the bottom part of the pyramid, we can't always do that with the crop protection product, or if we can, it takes a lot more of that crop protection product to try to fill that big bottom part of the pyramid. So more than anything, just wanted to remind folks that crop protection products are important. Really excited to have Miravis Duo as part of our portfolio, but that doesn't mean that it's going to make up for cutting corners when you're doing your crop planning. Crop quality itself in the field is made up of two different pieces. So the first is your disease management and your second is insect management. Disease management is just keeping those leaves alive, healthy, photosynthesizing for as long as possible to get the most amount of fruit or harvestable product off the field. Your insect management, very similarly, is trying to keep those leaves healthy, virus-free from things that might be coming around like leaf hoppers, and you want to keep as much of that foliage there as possible, again, to help photosynthesize and drive yield. We do have a new insecticide coming for onions specifically. Um, hopefully we'll have that in time for the season, but as things develop, we'll be sure to keep you in the loop on that one. In something like brassicas, um, specifically broccoli, we're pretty excited to have Miravis Duo as part of our portfolio because we've seen excellent control of alternaria. When we talk about Miravis brands or the Adepidin brand itself, we consider this a step change when it comes to control of alternaria species across different crops. You can see there the severity in the untreated part of our plot. 20% of the heads had alternaria, 
and or we had a 20% severity of alternaria across our plot. And then when it comes to disease control, we're doing an excellent job with Miravis Duo keeping that disease at bay. In cucurbits, we're seeing similar results when it comes to powdery mildew. This is a butternut squash field from 2019, and we did about eight different varieties of this. Um, it really showed a difference in one of the varieties, which is pretty cool. You can see there on the new growth, this is five weeks after our last application. I wouldn't consider this normal. Like I said, we saw it in one variety, but it was pretty cool to see that longevity of control from Miravis in their program. In tomatoes, this is a field late August and a grower trying to get that Thanksgiving market with their tomatoes. And again, using Miravis as part of their program has done an excellent job keeping those leaf diseases at bay and letting that plant try to push yields for as long as possible. In onions, we're pretty excited to have this product because it's two modes of action that are both working on Stemphilium. We're picking up other diseases as well, but for those of you growing onions, we know it's quite a struggle with the resistance that we're seeing there. Lastly, just to finish up on sustainable management, we have multiple parts that we're trying to balance as farmers and consultants and retail folks to make sure we're staying ahead of resistance. We're trying to stay ahead of weed, resistance, which we've seen develop over time and is continuing to develop in the area we're working in. We've seen insects start to become resistant to different things as well, and we're trying to manage that. And also this disease piece, I've already mentioned the stemphilium with resistance that we see. So just wanted to touch on quickly what that means and how we can do that a little bit better. When it comes to the risk of resistance, there's three pieces that we consider. The first is the fungicide, so how it works on the actual fungus itself, if it's at a point where the cell can quickly mutate or change and that fungicide doesn't work anymore. We look at the disease itself, and again, something like rhizoctonia that's in the soil and doesn't have the same replicating risk as something like downy mildew that changes our risk. And then we also look at the agronomy. So how often are we trying to manage that disease in our rotation? All of those things combine together to let us know how often or how much we can use any particular product on different diseases and different crops. I won't go into it today, but just wanted to make aware that there's this fungicide resistance action committee that is a bit of a guideline producer for different products and different things that we're doing. So it's not just the chemical companies that are coming up with the guidelines. Um, for things like a group seven, like Miravis or a group three, again, that's in Miravis Duo, we wanna make sure we're following the guidelines to reduce resistance risk. And you can find all that information. I've included the site there at the bottom. I'd encourage you to look at that as you're planning for your crop protection this year in order to keep ahead of resistance. There's a few, I kind of mentioned this one. I know I'm running out of time, um, but again, when it comes to resistance, we wanna make sure we're not relying on one product or one particular group of products to do all the heavy lifting for us. We want to use the recommended dose, don't cut rates in order to control diseases. We want to make sure we're going by the label and we want to introduce multiple modes of action into our schedule, again, to keep that disease at bay when it comes to res developing resistance. So how can we do that with the Syngenta portfolio? We can use all of the different tools that are in our toolbox in different spots and rotate them with different groups. Something like our group three, so our Quadrostop or Probiotop Miravis Duo, we can use that for up to 50% of our whole spray program because they're mixed with good resistance management partners in something like tomatoes. We want to use our broad spectrum multi-site products like Bravo or such in between, but it gives us confidence that we can control the disease and keep resistance at bay. You'd see the same thing for squash if we took time to look at it, but believe them right out of time. So again, just quickly wanted to talk about adepidin and the power of that molecule. Hopefully you can use some of it this year as Miravis Duo to protect crop quality and sustainably manage different diseases. Thank you. All right, does anyone have any questions? 
So you can uh, use the chat, by the way, if you want to, right? Or just unmute and start talking. If you have a question that comes up during the um, speaker, you can put it in chat anytime. Forgot to mention that, I think. Thank you, folks, for your time. If you do have questions, I'll stick around um, or feel free to message or call on the number there that was on the screen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you. And um, thank you very much. And uh, interesting stuff happening out there. Now we are um, introducing um, Travis Kramer um, from the Omafra. Thank you very much, Travis, to uh, come to our meeting today and speak on the identification and management of onion diseases in Ontario. And I ask you to um, extend your, um, your uh, introduction on your own so that we know exactly what you do. Sounds good. Thanks, Reed Helm. Uh, are you able to see my screen okay? Yep. Right on. Uh, so I'm gonna be going over some onion diseases today. Travis Cranmer, vegetable crop specialist uh, with Omafra, covering alliums, brassicas, and leafy greens. I'm one of four vegetable crop specialists, uh, two of which are based out of Ridgetown, Elaine Roddy and Amanda Tracy, and Dennis Van Dyke and I are based out of Guelph. So here's our pest activity calendar with pathogens listed across the top and insects uh, are on the bottom. And the presentation that I'm giving today is uh, modified and, and, and part of a presentation that I, I normally give uh, to the Onion IPM session that we hold every April or May. And I think this year it's going to be around uh, May 12th. Um, we also go over disorders and insects. And uh, getting back to the chart, uh, we could see that onion smut is our, uh, can be seen as early as May. Uh, with pink roots starting a little bit later in the season. But um, yeah, we're, we're basically going to start with the early season onion pathogens and then work our way to the later season ones. So first off, we have onion smut. Uh, the leaves become lighter. There are black streaks that appear on the inside of the leaf. And eventually these leaves will burst open and it will look like black muck soil has collected on the inside of the leaf. Um, what happens is that the spores germinate really early in the season. They infect that flag leaf as it is emerging from the soil. So the fungi grows inside uh, systemically throughout the plant in cool and wet weather, um, colonizes the leaves and lowers the overall photosynthetic rate of the plant. Uh, if the weather continues to be cool and wet in the spring, we tend to see more plants die at the seedling stage. Whereas if we have a warmer or even a hot um, dry spring, uh, the plants seem to be able to continue on and, um, and you see stunting later in the season. Um, as these leaves dry down, uh, the spores, they're spread by water, equipment, wind, uh, anything that's carrying or moving soil. And it's also possible for infected bulbs to infect or pass the pathogen on to other bulbs in storage. Uh, we don't see that a lot in Ontario just because with the stunting that occurs with this pathogen throughout the season, that mature bulb um, that would have onion smut is probably not going to make the grade and make it into your storage. So growers can use a seed treatment uh, to protect from infection. This is quite uh, effective because given that the fungi attacks at the seedling stage, you're, you're, you're catching it early. And uh, five-year crop rotation that excludes alliums will uh, drastically reduce the uh, amount of spores that are in the soil that are viable. But in most cases, this 
uh, isn't possible. The next pathogen uh, that's early season is pink root. And uh, similar to onion smut, uh, pink root causes the plants to appear stunted. They may exhibit tip dieback. And uh, when plants are pulled, the roots look uh, visibly pink. And so this FOMA fungus uh, prepares temperatures over 24 degrees Celsius. And while it infects the roots, uh, and, uh, and, and kills those roots, those, those dead roots that come off act as an entry point for uh, the basal plate for other pathogens to colonize, uh, such as fusarium. So while uh, pink root may not be a huge uh, yield uh, a drain, it does allow other pathogens to get established. So, a crop rotation of three years will also decrease spore levels. Resisted cultivars are available. And as a scout, I would uh, carefully dig up uh, and use a trowel to actually catch the roots because a lot of the times you pull up the, the plant and you are uh, leaving the roots in the ground and you're also, um, you're not catching what, what pathogen is actually uh, the issue. Next uh, pathogen uh, is Botrytis, foliar pathogen. And I have not seen much Botrytis in onions over the last four to five years. Uh, it's got this characteristic oval uh, halo, silvery halo on the leaf around the, uh, the lesion. And as these lesions come together and coalesce, uh, you, you get the, photosynthetic rate going down and premature senescence. So it's possible to see this pathogen in mid-June. However, the amount of botrytis uh, has been so low and this is likely because the fungicides that we're applying to manage stemphilium also target and suppress botrytis. So, if you happen to see botrytis in your field uh, and you are managing for stemphilium, give me a call. That's of interest. I'd like to see that. Uh, there are some management strategies on the slide, but it's unlikely that you're going to need to use them. So I've mentioned stemphilium. Uh, we're going to start with Alternaria first or purple blotch, and they're both on uh, this slide here. So we've got Stemphilium on the left and purple blotch or Alternaria on the right. Uh, Alternaria or purple blotch uh, is tan to brown spots that kind of have a pinkish purplish hue with them. And what's characteristic are these uh, concentric rings uh, around the lesion. Uh, as we see in um, other alternaria species attacking vegetables. And uh, it can be confused with uh, stemphilium, and that's why I wanted to include both on the slide here. So you're looking for these oval lesions with brown centers. Um, the alternaria spores over winter uh, on the edges of field in uh, crop matter that has, or uh, debris that haven't decomposed from the previous year. And these spores germinate in the spring when there's adequate temperature and, and moisture and move into the crop by wind or splashing water. So Alternaria is generally a weak pathogen in onions and it is often colonizing the sites where wounds have occurred. Uh, so preventing uh, preventing uh, damage from machinery, equipment, uh, going through the field will cut down on the amount of purple spot. Um, also removing uh, or relocating call piles, uh, good crop rotation, and uh, rotating your fungicide groups will cut down on the amount of purple blotch you see. So looking next at Stemphilium, uh, this Fungi is, is the most uh, damaging foliar pathogen uh, that affects all growers every year uh, throughout southwestern Ontario. We've got these uh, tan spots that are streaking uh, along uh, 
often starting sometimes in the middle, but at the tips and moving down. And it's not an oval. It's not contained like a purple uh, blotch lesion. It's less contained. And uh, it's also found on leaves that were damaged by wind, uh, pests, or uh, herbicides. So it can look a lot like tip burn and these little spores are spread by wind and uh, what else could I say here? Leaf lesion occurs one to two weeks after inoculation and basically it's important to limit the amount of inoculum that you're starting with. Uh, so cultivate, uh, get rid of the debris from last year's crop as soon as you harvested. Allow that residue to break down when we have uh, some heat later in the fall. Um, and the, the higher chance that that residue is able to break down, the lower the inoculum level should be the following year. At the same time, it's important to manage weed hosts and manage the level of thrips uh, because uh, multiple studies have shown that thrips can be a vector and are moving this uh, pathogen around. There are no fungicides that control stem phyllium. Everything that is registered is uh, suppression. And uh, we are, our hands are kind of tied here with what's registered on onions and what um, seems to work. Uh, there seems to be some suppressiveness with Mancozeb and, uh, and then group sevens work the best. Uh, but how, how do you rotate group sevens when you just have group sevens that work and are, are, are registered? Uh, in Ontario, there's a very high resistance in stemphilium to one of the active ingredients in Quadris, which is an 11 and 3, and Luna Tranquility, which is a 7 and 9. So it has been suggested by the Muckcrops Research Station to avoid or reduce these fungicides in onions. Uh, but, but that's tricky when you're managing other pathogens. So I, I made this quick chart to show the different frac groups and the different fungicides that um, might have some efficacy on onions and uh, or, or have, have been tested against stemphilium on onions. And uh, as I mentioned, Quadris Top and Luna, uh, it seems that one of the active ingredients is resistant um, and if we look at what is actually registered on stemphilium, we've got Circadus, Aprovia, um, Moravis, Moravis Duo, Luna, and Quadris Toff um, are registered for suppression. Uh, so, so basically we're rotating group sevens um, and if we use uh, a Mancozeb product to manage purple blotch or, or another leaf pathogen that is uh, registered on, um, we, we're, we're basically back and forth between that and a group seven. So it's, it's extremely difficult to keep your plants free of stemphilium throughout the entire season. Uh, I located on, or I put on the right of the column for stemphilium leaf blight, uh, the, the ranking at which the Buck Crops Research Station uh, showed suppression of stemphilium in their 2019 field trial, but it's also worth noting that there were no significant differences between these products and the untreated check. Uh, there were numerical differences and Circadus was number one, Aprovia was number two, Pristine was three, and Luna Tranquility was four. So next uh, foliar pathogen is downy mildew. Uh, it's got this purpley, gray, velvety growth. Uh, infected leaves turn pale green, yellow, and then collapse. And it starts out as this uh, maybe two foot uh, circle in the field. Um, something that we, we, might, we might miss when we're walking the field. And then two or three days later, we've got that whole area um, getting larger, maybe 10, 15 feet. And at, at that point, like, uh, like you wanted to apply your preventative fungicide uh, two weeks ago. 
These spores are able to infect when the foliage remains wet for two hours at less than 22 degrees Celsius. And the spores germinate at night and spread during the day by wind or rain. So downy mildew is an oomycete, not a true fungi. And so many of the fungicides targeting something like Semphilium or Alternaria, um, they may not have any effect on downy mildew. Downcast has been developed to predict downy mildew um, outbreaks. And as, as we, uh, it's, it's really important to take those uh, forecasts seriously. Um, many fungicides are only effective as a protective and it's important to manage this early. If onions die standing up, there's a good chance that they'll not last in storage. Their overall quality will be damaged. Um, what else do I want to say? So Arondis Ultra, Aliette, Ritamel Gold have seemed to perform well in trials at the Muckrox Research Station against downy mildew. The next pathogen that I'd like to cover is iris yellow spot virus. This was first identified in Ontario in 2007 and has not been seen much since. Um, these are pictures from Jen Allen and uh, essentially this pathogen creates tan lesions with islands of green. Um, so you've got this sunken tan lesion and then uh, this area that looks unaffected. It's vectored by onion thrips, so it's important to manage these thrips if the pathogen has been found in the area. There are egg dia strips, uh, amino strips, where you're able to take a cutting of the onion leaf, put it in to the, the test and uh, crush the leaf tissue and put in a little strip. And depending on if there's one band or two, you can see within five minutes whether the sample you have is in fact iris yellow spot virus. And these, these uh, these Eggdia amino strip tests are relatively cheap, like under $10 per test. Now moving into um, uh, rots and uh, that effect the fall. So we'll start with Fusarium basal rot. I tend to see a lot of cases of Fusarium basal rot with uh, in cases where the onions have been sitting in moisture or they're grown in plastic. Might see it early by um, identifying it if the leaves are turning yellow. And if you pull up the bulb and the roots are missing, that's uh, pretty symptomatic as well. In some cases, under the right circumstances, there may be white fuzzy growth or these orange spores developing near the base. So what can be done? A four-year crop rotation. There might be resisted cultivars that work depending on what type of onion you're growing. Um, I would consider a biological uh, that might suppress fusarium, something like root shield or, or something that, that can be applied uh, in the irrigation. Uh, you want to allow the soil to dry out during irrigation events and uh, irrigate early in the morning so that the soil, the plants have time to dry out throughout the day. Don't water at night and allow those plants to sit uh, wet all, all night and into the early morning. Next pathogen I hope none of you will ever come across, uh, sclerotinium white rot. This uh, soft rot uh, gives a fuzzy white mycelium and it looks similar to some cases of fusarium, but if you were to put this bulb into a Ziploc bag and check back in two to three days, you'd get these little black sclerotia uh, around the size of a poppy seed growing on that white fuzzy growth. So if you're ever uh, worried that the fusarium or something that you suspect is fusarium could be white rock, throw it in a Ziploc bag and check back in two to three days. Um, the fusarium will not have that black poppy seed uh, sclerotia and will likely have maybe a reddish hue to it. So these little black sclerotia are, are able to 
lay dormant in the soil for up to 40 years and germinate when the crop, uh, susceptible crop is planted. So it's, it's really important to manage this, um, uh, fumigate if found, uh, limit the spread of this pathogen if you were to ever find it. Um, separate machinery might be used if you're going into that field and infected onions should be removed and buried uh, away from an onion growing field. Um, and yeah, the good biosecurity is key here. And then there are nematodes. Uh, there are some nematodes that go after the plant tissue at the, uh, or like in, in the leaf, but then there's also ones that attack the basal plate like bulb and stem nematode. Uh, you might have heard bulb and stem nematode affecting garlic. There are nematode species that can infect both garlic and onions, uh, but the one that we have that seems to infect garlic in Ontario uh, doesn't seem to uh, do much uh, with onion. It, onion will be a host, but it doesn't seem to be an issue. And uh, this is likely due to the fact that we're, we're planting onion seeds every year, Whereas with garlic, you're planting that um, daughter clove from the mother bulb and that, that clove contains the nematodes from the previous season. So you're inoculating the soil when you plant next year's crop with garlic. Whereas with onions, you're, you're just planting that seed. So we're getting misshapen uh, bulbs and onion uh, become distorted, twisted and it can be confused with uh, splitting at the base, which might be because of too much water in a short period of time. Um, so to confirm that you're actually dealing with nematodes, uh, send some samples to the lab. The last nematode I'd like to discuss is root knot nematode. This nematode lives in deeper parts of the soil, uh, attack the roots, not the bulb, the only way you're going to see this is if you are using a trowel to dig up the roots, the plant, uh, because if you pull that plant up, the roots are going to break off and you're going to be leaving that root knot nematode uh, deep in the soil and you're, you're never going to see it. And lastly, I'd like to go over some bacterial rots. So there are at least 13 genera of uh, bacteria that have been identified that attack onion, several species within each genus, as well as different strains within a species. First, we're gonna talk about a slippery skin. And your first clue is that the onions smell absolutely delightful. Um, and if you squeeze that onion, the inner portions may uh, slide right out of it. It's uncertain exactly where the inoculum source is, but it's likely call piles or crop debris. Um, so if the bacteria makes its way into an irrigation pond or ditch and these bacteria cells make it in to the plant uh, through irrigation um, in, uh, via a wound uh, made by thrips uh, or uh, wind damage or equipment, that might be how that bacteria makes its way into the bulb. So another bacterial pathogen is sour skin, similar life cycle as slippery skin, and you've got these infected scales or rings that are yellow, slimy, and separate uh, easily. And soft rot, it's, it's the same as the other two, but it's, it's mainly infecting the uh, inner rings of that onion. So what can be done? Um, bacterial rots are still not fully understood, and there's research going on in the United States uh, by the Onion Multistate Working Group, and they're evaluating every management strategy that you can think of. Um, I'm listing these management strategies on the slide here in order of what I believe to be most likely to have an effect to least likely to have an effect on preventing damage from bacterial rots. Um, so bury infested residue or volunteer onions uh, that you might have to get rid of, like that, that should be number one. Uh, practicing a four-year crop rotation and, and rotating with non-host crops. If bacterial rots continue to be an issue year after year after year, that's something that needs to be considered. Um, 
there is less likely to see uh, bacteria rots in fields that have a drip irrigation system instead of overhead. That might not be feasible for cooking onions, but I'm seeing uh, it a lot uh, now in Spanish onion production. Uh, increasing the plant spacing uh, to improve air circulation can help. Choosing cultivars with thinner necks. Um, and there's actually some evidence there that uh, if the onion's able to lodge properly um, and that uh, neck isn't as thick at uh, harvest, there's less likely to be a chance of that onion bacterial cell to get into the bulb and cause problems in storage later. So plants that died prematurely standing up had uh, two times as much bulb rot uh, as uh, those that were um, harvested after they had lodged, um, according to a 2015 study. Management throughout the season, like I said, avoid overhead irrigation. It might be a great idea to stop irrigation earlier in the season if you see any uh, sort of bacterial rot developing. Uh, using uh, ozone or UV to sterilize your irrigation water could help. There is also some evidence to suggest that reducing the nitrogen application later in the season can help. Uh, these new onion cultivars may not require the full 100 uh, pounds per acre of nitrogen uh, that was suggested decades ago. You want to minimize injury to the leaves in the bulb. Uh, with herbicides or thrips and uh, obviously manage downy mildew so that those bulbs don't um, die standing up. And uh, yeah, choose cultivars with thinner necks, which I already described. Um, yeah, I guess the last slide of management at harvest, uh, just, just to get the point home, um, Minimize as much injury to the bulb by machinery as possible. Reduce the height of drops. Uh, lift onions as uh, once the majority have lodged. So one study, and I'm going to refer to this study uh, for these next three bullet points. Um, it was done in New Zealand in 1997. So they had uh, a trial where they pulled onions at 10% lodging versus those at 90% lodging. And those at 10% had 7.5% bacterial rot, and uh, those that were uh, lodged 90% uh, uh, only had 3.5% rot. So waiting for that onion to fully lodge definitely decreased the amount of bacterial rot. Pulling the onions from the field before a large pre uh, precipitation event uh, also uh, helped with decreasing the amount of bulb rot, and then pulling the onions right away and putting them into a forced air dryer for five days um, to greatly reduce the amount of bulb rot uh, down to less than 2%. Uh, whether the, the onions were at 10% lodging or 90% lodging. So if it's going to be uh, very wet in the forecast after uh, the onions have been lifted, it might be good to just get them out of the field and force air dry if that option is available. So that is a summary of the main pathogens affecting onions in Ontario. Our retired colleague, Mike Shaletti, always showed us these resources that were available at the end of the IPM presentations that he gave. And I'd also like to highlight that these are great books to have on the dashboard of your truck. And there is also a um, online resource, uh, Ontario Crop IPM, with an onion section that is also a great resource, but digital. So I'd like to thank those listed on the screen. And if you haven't already, to subscribe to the On Vegetables blog, where we'll be um, posting uh, crop updates throughout the growing season for onions, as well as a host of other vegetable crops. Any questions? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Travers. Uh, Travis, uh, we had, um, um, I was in quite a bit of onion fields involved last year and I saw all these diseases and there was quite a bit of pressure. 
Uh, so I think uh, you addressed, I learned something today, quite a few things that I didn't know. So that's good. Um, any questions to Travis? The lot's taken in, in 30 minutes, and I normally spend about an hour and 15 to cover all of those things, but I, I tried to pick pieces that would be relevant. So if, uh, if you have any questions... Especially feel in most presentations, and, uh, you know, it's um, a good thing to think about it and to reflect on it, and then there's, of course, more questions all the time, so... Anyways, I have one question for Travis, actually. Um, just wondering how weather conditions affect the likelihood of getting a bacterial problem in the onions. Uh, very high. Um, like irrigation uh, right after or right before we have two or three inches of rain. Um, holy cow. Like you're it's it's tough to, to manage. Um, Everything that I said about bacterial rots is all hypothetical and hasn't really been proven by multiple trials. Uh, but there is definitely, I think, a correlation between irrigation, the amount of rain, and the chance of seeing bacterial rots uh, become a problem in storage months later. Is there a difference between... Um overhead irrigation you can have boom irrigation with fine nozzles uh is that better than of course than a gun um so a gun yeah that you also have that compounding effect of potential wounding to the leaf depending on the onion cultivar uh if the bacteria is in the irrigation water that you're pulling from uh, I could see there, there being a problem either way because you're still getting damage from herbicides, thrifts, and other pathogens. Uh, I would say that you're, you're more likely to see slightly higher amounts with a boom, but I have no data to support that. Yeah, okay, no. Got you. If it's in the irrigation water, yeah, of course. Yeah. <clears throat> right on. Well, if, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to email or call me um, anytime. Okay. Good. Thank you so much, Travis. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for having me today to speak. Uh, as Nicole said, my name is Laura Arts and I work with Bayer. Uh, I do focus more on the horticultural side and my job is, uh, I would say, technical support for horticulture. So uh, my contact info is there. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. And what I wanted to do today was uh, go over a few different um, label registrations that we've had. And I wanted to start off by going through uh, some label changes that we've had with Admire. So uh, Admire actually went through, and this was for a couple different uh, neonics. So um, Actera, Admire, and Clutch all went through a um, pollinator review. Uh, that was done by the PMRA, and that was about a year and a half ago. And um, why I thought I would mention it today briefly is because the PMRA did give growers a grace period of following what I would call the old admire label. And that grace period is over as of this April. So basically meaning that for all intents and purposes, growers now need to start following the new uh, admire label. And for some crops, that really didn't make a whole heck of a lot of difference. Uh, so these are crop groups that really had no change to the Admire label. So, for example, anyone that was working in um, some of the root vegetables or coal crops or tobacco, and it's easy to think of that because it is a pollinator study. So for crops that are not very attractive to pollinators, there was really no changes that happened. But where we do see quite a few changes is crops that are attractive to pollinators. And I thought for any tomato or pepper growers that are on the, the meeting this morning, I wanted to mention that there is a, uh, quite a significant change to the admire label for those crops. So uh, what we have lost is the soil application. So for anyone that was using it on um, tomatoes or peppers, at planting, that registration has been removed. 
you can still find the crop group on the admire label, but the application is post bloom only as a foliar application, which for those crops is really um, very challenging to still use that. Um, so I thought I would mention that. So in case anyone is not aware of that, that they are aware of that change that's happened. And if there's anyone with other crops here, I just really focused on that because that is the biggest change for this year. Uh, if you have questions, reach out to me and I'm happy to go through whether anything's changed on crops you might be using it on. But I did want to mention, uh, we do have a number of different insecticides that have activity on the same pest that Admire did. So what I've done here is shown three different insecticides. I've listed all the pests that they have activity on and the bolded pests are ones that Admire also had activity on. So you could look and, and replace depending on what you may have been using Admire for. And I thought I would spend a minute on Savantoprime because that's a, an insecticide that we have that, you know, in a lot of cases, what growers were using Admire for uh, in the crops that we're looking at today would be for aphids, leafhoppers, or Colorado potato beetle. And Savantoprime works on all of those pests. So I thought I'd just spend a minute on it. So Savantoprime is a group 4D insecticide. So our neonics are 4A insecticides. So this is not a uh, insecticide you'd want to rotate with neonics, but in the chance that you're not using the neonics this year, it's got a great fit. Uh, it works by both ingestion and contact activity. And you can see the different pests that it has activity on on the bottom of the screen. So primarily in vegetables, it's for aphids, leafhoppers, and Colorado potato beetle. The uh, really great feature of Savanto is it's got an excellent safety profile in particular for honeybees. So uh, it really allows its use in a lot of crops where um, Admire can no longer be used. So it does have very fast knockdown uh, and it also has fast feeding cessation, which is great for some crops uh, where you're worried about aphids transmitting diseases because they, they stop feeding very quickly after the application. And it also has, it is locally systemic, but it also has what's called translaminar movement, meaning if you spray it on the top surface of the leaf, that it'll move to the underside. And that's particularly important for aphids because in a lot of crops, aphids are feeding on the underside of the leaves. So uh, you can be confident that you're gonna get uh, control of them on the underside of the leaf with this product. And then I just thought I would mention what our label is for tomatoes and peppers, because as I said, that is one of the big uses where I think with us losing Admire, there is um, a greater need for something like this. So you can see as a foliar, you can use a 200 to 300 mil per acre rate and go after aphids and leafhoppers. Uh, it is a higher rate if you're going after Colorado potato beetle. So you can see 300 to 400 mils per acre. I mentioned it is safe to pollinators. We do have a um, comment on our label that we recommend to apply early morning and evening when bees are not foraging, but it is uh, safe to pollinators. And I thought it was worth mentioning that uh, Ridgetown College has done work over the last two years on doing soil applications with Savanto Prime for controlling Colorado potato beetle. And uh, that has been submitted to uh, through minor use. So we are hoping to have that for next year, but that will not be for this coming season. This coming season, it'll just be um, as a foliar application. And I also wanted to do a very quick update to let you know that Ethrol has gone through a reevaluation update and uh, through the PMRA. And I thought it was worth mentioning for any tomato growers that are on the uh, call today. Uh, it is really, for the most part, a really good news story. So two big things to mention. One is that use patterns will remain for tomatoes, tobacco, sour cherries, blueberries, and wheat. So I know for tomatoes and tobacco uh, growers were worried that we might lose that and that will not be happening. And then the other thing that I'll mention is that any changes that will take effect to the label will not happen for another two years. So um, this is kind of how the PMRA is handling things now where they let the registrant know what changes are happening to a label but they don't actually change for two years. Um, as opposed to what we had with Admire where our label changed but growers still had that um, grace period, so to speak. 
Okay, I wanted to spend a few minutes on Vellum Prime. And the reason for that is we have had this product registered for a few years, but we got a, uh, through the minor use system, we got a lot of label expansion this past fall uh, that I thought you guys might be interested in. So just to tell you a bit about Vellum Prime, uh, this is actually a fungicide. It's our, our group seven SDHI. And so as you can see on the top there, key diseases, it, it is a fungicide, it has activity on diseases. So for a number of different vegetable crops were registered on early blight, black dot and powdery mildew suppression. Uh, the really cool thing about our, this SDHI is that it's uh, the only SDHI to have activity on nematodes. And so it works on both juveniles as well as adults. Uh, the active ingredient is called fluopyram. And it's uh, confirmed to be a true nematicide, which means it actually kills nematodes when it comes in contact with them, as opposed to something that might repel them or something like that. So the additional crops that we got added to our label in the fall, uh, I'll just cover the vegetable crops here. So we've got brassica leafy vegetables, so all your coal crops, you know, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, uh, and we have nematode and powdery mildew suppression. For fruiting vegetables, so tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, we have nematode and early blight suppression. And then for your cucumbers, pumpkin, squash, that crop group, we've got nematode and powdery mildew suppression. So we're pretty excited about that. And uh, just a note, if there is any garlic growers, uh, Travis had mentioned about garlic uh, nematodes being an issue in garlic. That has been submitted, but we don't have that registered yet. So hopefully later this year. I thought I'd just take a minute to talk about nematodes and vegetables because I think, uh, you know, there isn't really a lot of awareness, I think, about nematodes out there. And there's lots of different symptoms that can be associated with nematode uh, injury. So stunting, wilting of plants, lack of vigor, yellowing, stem twisting, crown and ball bloating, root forking, root distortion, and in some cases, if it's serious, even plant death. Uh, root lesion nematode is the most um, prevalent in, in our area, and uh, it can have a significant impact on yield. The other uh, nematode that can be, uh, is probably the second most popular, is root knot nematode. Uh, root lesion nematode is also suspected to increase vine decline in tomatoes and also has um, a connection to early dye in potatoes. There's a relationship with the, with the nematodes in those diseases. So uh, I also thought this was interesting that I learned that in the case of tomatoes, about 20% of the annual yield loss worldwide is estimated to be associated with uh, nematodes and injury from nematodes. So uh, something, I guess, to just keep your eyes out for. And this I thought would be interesting because this is actually looking from tomato fields in southwestern Ontario. And what they looked at was what types of nematodes they were finding in the soil. And you can see there's a huge list of nematodes here. And when you look at tomatoes and even peppers for that matter, uh, they are a host to a lot of nematodes. The two that I highlighted there are the two that are uh, tend to be most problematic. So the top highlight, highlighted one there is root knot nematode, and then Pratolanchus is root lesion nematode. So, but you can see there is a lot um, that they found in the in tomato field soils in southwestern Ontario. So. This is some trial work that was done uh, out of the University of California. So I just wanted to show here, they were looking at damage on roots from root knot nematode. And the rating scale there on the side is where it would be one would be 0% damage and 10 would be 100% damage. Uh, and you can see here with Vellum Prime, it had a significant difference compared to the control treatment. So over 80% of the roots we're showing signs of uh, root not nematode damage in the control versus 25% uh, with vellum. And that was with a few applications of vellum. And then one other slide I wanted to show you for uh, looking at, again, root damage from nematodes in cucumbers. So what they're looking at, the 21DAA refers to 
21 days after the application of vellum. So in this case, the black bar is the untreated check. So you can see 21 days after the application that over 60% of the roots were showing incidence of root galls from root knot nematode versus in vellum prime 21 days after the application, you can see it was just over 10% of the root showing symptom. So uh, for anyone who's concerned with, uh, with nematodes in their soil, I think this is a great option for, for any of those crops. So I, th I thought I would just mention how we would recommend uh, vellum prime be used in vegetables. So the first point is the way to apply it. How we are labeled to uh, apply vellum prime is through drip irrigation. And Bayer may look in the future at expanding how we apply this, but the US has quite a bit of experience with vellum prime for nematodes. And the most consistent results they've had have been when it's been used through drip irrigation. And I think the idea behind that is, you know, the roots end up getting trained to move towards where the drip irrigation is. So then when you apply the vellum prime through there, it's most likely to come in contact with the roots. Uh, vellum prime does not move easily through the soil. So we wanna try where we think we're gonna get the best activity and where you guys will see the best results. And as we get more experience with it through other application um, setups, then we may look at expanding the label. We also would recommend to um, run water for, if you're doing it through your drip irrigation, pre-wet the soil for maybe 30 minutes with your drip irrigation prior to putting the vellum on so that it can move through the soil a little bit better. And um, you can do up to two applications a year and it's 200 mils per acre. Okay, and then the last thing that I wanted to touch on is a new insecticide that we have registered on a wide range of fruit and vegetable crops. Uh, I will mention that we do not have USMRLs right now, so we do expect to get them uh, anytime now, so they should be in place for this season, uh, but we're still waiting on that. And this just shows the different insect pests and the crop groups that uh, we're focusing on with Viego. Uh, so you can see here the, the crops that I'm going to really focus on is the coal crops. So you can see broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, that crop group, it has activity on a wide range of insects. So imported cabbage worm and diamondback moth, it's very strong on. Uh, cutworms, armyworms, flea beetles, and it does have suppression of aphids. It has activity on loopers, but it's not quite as strong on loopers as it is on cabbage worm and diamondback moth. Uh, and then eggplant, uh, peppers, and tomatoes, you can see at 60 mils per acre, it covers Colorado potato beetles, cutworm, armyworm, uh, flea beetles, so wide range of pests there. So I mentioned Viego is a group 28 insecticide. It does work mainly by ingestion and how it works is as the insect ingests the uh, chemical, it causes an influx of calcium in the cells, uh, the muscle cells of the insect and it causes the muscles to contract and the larva um, get paralyzed and die. So what I want to show you in this little video, this is actually army worm and it's over a 14 hour period. And you can see when the larvae are small, uh, you can still see them moving around up to 14 hours after, but you can see this immediate feeding cessation. They aren't doing more damage feeding like they are in the untreated, which is a really great feature of the product. It has very long lasting activity and it works uh, in most cases, the insects we're going after, you're targeting the larva. Uh, but in the case of something like Colorado potato beetle where the adults are present and doing damage as well, uh, it does actually work on larva and adults. And uh, it is locally systemic, but what I wanna show you here is the great residual it has. So you can see here when they just applied the product in this pink circle, you can see 12 days after application, there's still a very high amount of active ingredient at that place where the product was. And another thing to show the residual here, this is looking at diamondback moth in coal crops. But what they did here is they sprayed the plants and then they didn't introduce the insect until either a five days after or 12 days after the, the plants were sprayed. And you can see here with Viego, uh, still virtually 100% control 12 days after the application was made. 
And another advantage of Viego, uh, I think for coal crops or other crops that have issues with flea beetles, is it is very strong on flea beetles uh, and probably stronger than some of the other group 28s that are on the market. And just a couple more slides here. I just wanted to show for tomato growers that are concerned with Colorado potato beetle, uh, this is a great option. What I wanna show you here is uh, when we compared it, this trial was done in Quebec, so there is some um, widespread resistance to admire there. That's why the admire doesn't look very good. But when you look at Corrigin compared to Delegate compared to Viego, the first bar here is two days after application. So you can see with Viego, it was not the fastest knockdown of the products, but it did give 100% control uh, and was the only product to give 100% control. And it also has the longest residual. You can still see 75% uh, control uh, three weeks after the application. And this just shows it works on a wide range of, of life stages of Colorado potato beetle. Here's just a little video again showing uh, that the insects do need to do some feeding, but you can see that the feeding doesn't change much from one hour after, after application to 24 hours after application. So it's very quick to stop them from feeding. And I guess the last comment I'll make here is Viego is safe to pollinators provided you follow the label. So in the case of fruiting vegetables, that's really the most restrictive how you can use it. It does need to be an early season application because it needs to be on prior to bloom. So where you would use this that I could see is if you had early season Colorado potato beetle or say cutworm early in the season, it is a great fit there. Once it gets to flowering, you'd want to use Savanto Prime. So just to summarize, it is a powerful second generation diamide uh, and it has great um, immediate feeding cessation on a lot of key target pests like imported cabbage worm, diamondback moth, cutworm, Colorado potato beetle, and flea beetle. And I just wanted to thank you guys for your time today and for making the effort to come on to a Zoom meeting and to Lakeside for having me speak today. Thank you, Laura. Uh, looks like there's one question in the chat. Um, oh, okay. Is vellum prime a drench or in trench application for tree fruit? Uh, for tree fruit, we do really want to have it go through drip application, application again. Um, I would say for all uses, we would like, uh, we'd like to focus on drip. Um, I think we may look at expanding that in the future, but we want to get a bit of experience with it uh, through different application methods. Very awesome. Can you say um, something about the Valum Prime as the second application? If you didn't mention it already, uh, later on, because uh, the label it says that has also function on other diseases and what it does, just not any metal. Yeah. Yeah, it does have suppression of a number of different uh, pathogens as well. So typically the reason we focus early on for nematodes is so that they're not doing damage early on. Um, and then you get some early season benefits of disease protection when you use it then. But would you, you recommend it to use it later on in the, again? I guess what I would say is if your nematode pressure is high, and you decide to do two applications, then you probably would put it maybe a month apart. Uh, if your target is, say, powdery mildew or early blight or something, and that is what you're more concerned with, you're gonna you you will get better activity out of a foliar application of a fungicide, like um, say for powdery mildew, Luna sensation would do a better job as a targeted time fungicide application over an early season vellum prime. But if you have nematodes there as well you will get some added benefit on the disease side. All right, awesome. If there's no other questions, um, I'll hand it over to you, Friedhelm. Thank you again. Up in your soil and may not be aware of it until you start seeing a lot of damage on your potatoes. So that's why we are really excited to launch this as a new option for your for wireworm control. So as I said, it's a group 30. The active ingredient is called riflanolide. Um, it 
falls under what we call metadiamide. So it's not a it's not a diamide, but it does act similar to a diamide or a neonic, as in it's fast acting and it attacks the nervous system. But it attacks it at the GABA gated chloride channel as opposed to you know some of the other nervous system channels that you would get from other insects. So we ran this past year um, in 2020, we ran a few field scale trials because we wanted to take a look um, at how this would work, putting it into a grower's hand and doing some field applications. So EI is probably the uh, one sort of pocket that is most plagued with wireworms. So it seemed like the best spot to go to to run some of these trials. In this graph, we're looking at average feeding spots. So typically wireworms can come up, feed on potatoes uh, throughout the season. So you'll get scars and feeding holes. Scars usually mean they were feeding a little earlier in the season. Feeding holes probably means they were, they're there at harvest, chewing away on your potatoes. So in this case, we kind of combined both where we had the untreated where the average of the potatoes that we dug up was about three and a half feeding spots or scars, and compared it to capture, which was kind of the traditional wireworm product used. It is now, again, another product that has been put under review by PMRA, and it is no longer available, um, but we wanted to kind of use it as our standard, and then we compared that to Cymegra. So Cymegra performed really well, uh, reducing damage on your potatoes, but then also actually killing those fireworms so you're reducing the populations that are in the soil. So a few uh, key things about Cymegra, if you're going to try using it this year, is we've ran a number of tank mix compatibility tests just to make sure that this is an in furrow application only, so it's not a seed treatment, it has to be applied in furrow, so it will go into a tank and mix with some of your traditional insecticides, fungicides, um, things like that. So we've tested the majority of the products that we could find that are registered as an in application, and all of those uh, were just fine to take mix with. What we have found is that Cymegra does not play nice with um, uh, liquid fertilizers. So any of your in liquid fertilizers, your traditional like NPK, uh, it tends to create a lot of sediment, which could gum up sort of your, your sprayer. So we do not recommend that, um, but it, it's fine a lot. Any of the trials that we ran, most of them had two tanks. They were already putting their fungicides and insecticides in one and their fertilizer in another, and that was, worked just fine. Um, it all looked good, but we just want to make sure everyone is aware of that so they don't make a mess in their tank if they throw it in with some of the liquid fertilizer. So if you are not sure, I always encourage everybody to run a jar test ahead of time. You, you just have to mix the two products in a jar with some water. It takes only a few minutes and you'll notice whether there's sediment build up or whether it mixes in nicely. So it doesn't take very long and then gives you a bit of peace of mind that everything will look okay. And then just some frequently asked questions around Cymegra. Because this is a new product, it was just registered in the fall. We have North American MRLs established, so it's registered both here and in the US. So all of North America, we were fine for shipping, but it does take time to establish MRLs in other countries, such as uh, Japan and Europe and things like that. So just to be aware, we do not have MRLs established in all countries. Uh, for storage of this product, there's uh, typical of most products, just keep it uh, in a well-ventilated area, dry, and uh, prevent from freezing. Cymegra is also not systemic. So um, like your neonic, so if you're applying Titan on your potatoes as a seed treatment or in furrow application, it is systemic, so it will protect you from above ground, above ground pests, such as Colorado potato beetle and flea beetles. Cymegra does not do that. It only protects from insects in the ground from wireworms. Uh, so just to be aware that this is a, not a systemic product, where you're applying it, it was where it stays, and that's why it does such a good job on wireworms. It will uh, kill 
uh, by both contact and through ingestion. So if the wireworm sort of moves through the soil area where cymegra was applied, then it will also kill the wireworm. So just as a, to kind of review what I just talked about, uh, cymegra is group 30, roflanolide. It is registered on potatoes and corn as well. So it will be registered on sweet corn sort of as an inferro or a dribble application. We haven't talked a lot about that just because um, we do have the issue with mixing with your liquid fertilizers. So you have to be careful when uh, applying it on corn that you're not mixing it that way. But we're really excited about launching this product. It's fast acting, contact um, and ingestion to kill those wireworms. Um, and it's non-systemic. So um, that's kind of the sort of the key things about Cymegra. I'm going to go on to the next thing now and then I'll, you know, we can kind of answer questions. That are so I'm going to switch gears, talk about fungicides now. We are launching this year our new fungicide Maravon. This is new for us in Canada, but actually not new for North America. It has been registered in the U.S for about five or six years now. They registered Maravon the same time that we brought to Cicada. Um, but we always get lots of requests of why is Maravon not in Canada? So this is kind of brought to you by popular demand. We're now launching Maravon here in Canada. So Maravon is a combination of a group 11 and a group seven. So the group seven is Zemium on the right. That is the same active ingredient that's in Cicada. So we're off, it offers you all of those great benefits that Circadus has with the rain fastness, the consistent continuous control where it binds to the waxy cuticle and then has a slow release over time. So it gives you excellent disease control, as well as our group 11 paraclostrobin um, that gives you sort of those plant health benefits, helps with stress management and increases yields and things like that. So best of both worlds. The Maravon will be registered on a broad range of crops. Um, I'm just talking about the vegetables here, but it is registered um, for, on a number of fruit, fruit crops as well that you can look into. Um, <clears throat> but for now, we'll kind of focus on the vegetable side. First one, <clears throat> sorry, is bulb vegetables. So it'll be registered on all of your onion, garlic, leek. Um, this the diseases it controls are purple, purple blotch and botrytis, and it has suppression of stemphilium. So, sorry, Travis, I'm registering a num another group seven <laughs> for stemphilium, but, uh, that, but it does work equally as well as circadus because it has the same amount of act active ingredient. Uh, but just watch if you are using circadus, um, Maravon does have the same active, so you have to be careful with resistance management. So if you want, so for stem psyllium suppression, if you want to use Circadus is great. If you want to choose your tank mix partner, Maravon is great. If you want to add that sort of plant health benefit, uh, help with stress management of the plant and things like that. Um, I've also, I've created these tables. Um, we're finding now with PMRA when we're registering new products, they're uh, changing the way they want to view re-entry intervals and pre-harvest intervals. They're kind of putting a master table together that gives you both. So for all of our crops, when you are reading the label, sort of near the beginning, there'll actually be a table that lists, it's, they're, they're kind of putting them together and just listing uh, all of the different sort of touch points you might have as far as hand harvest or mechanical harvest and breaking it down. So. I'm kind of, that's kind of where I put these tables together as sort of an overall um, easy access, pre-harvest interval, re-entry interval, number of applications you're allowed to make and things like that. So the next one is cucurbits. Uh, this will be registered for powdery mildew, alternary leaf blight, uh, anthracnose, suppression of downy mildew, and suppression of gummy stem blight. Um, we have a wide range 
sort of diseases. And then again, as I mentioned, the pre-harvest intervals are kind of broken out into whether you're hand harvesting or mechanical harvest. And they also have re-intervals, re-entry intervals based on hand canning, burning, things like that. Um, Marivon, we have found that um, under extreme weather conditions. So if you're spraying, like when it's extremely hot, you have to be careful that you may get some injury. Um, so that just watch what you're putting in the tank and watch that it's not, you know, extremely hot. Next is also registered on leafy vegetables, such as lettuce, celery, spinach, etc., for powder mildew and sclerotinia. Uh, same with cucurbits, we have a pre-harvest of nine days for, for hand harvesting and then nine days for hand thinning. Um, the other thing that was mentioned on our label is that they have found when you mix Marivon, uh, if you're applying to spinach to only mix with water, it's just uh, because in some of the trial work, on occasion, again, when they're when it's applied during sort of extreme temperatures, they've seen some injury. So just be careful with the tight mixes with Marivon, just specifically for this spinach. And then root vet, root root vegetables for carrots, beets, turnips. This is also registered on ginseng, uh, horseradish, rutabagas, etc. We have the full crop group um, to control alternaria, powdery mildew, and cercospora. And then again, we have uh, pre-harvest interval of seven days and re-entry interval of just 12 hours there. And there's no, no concerns there as far as tank mixing goes. So to, to review, Marivon fungicide is that combination of a group seven, which is our Xemium, and group 11, Praclostrobin, uh, giving you kind of the best of both word worlds, excellent disease control, plus your plant health. And then next, I just wanted to touch on uh, Seraphil. So Seraphil is, will also be new for some growers this year. This is not a new product, but we've had a large label extension. So in 2019, we registered Seraphil on grapes. Um, and now we are increasing that label to uh, have a number of berry and vegetable crops. So Seraphil is a fungicide, but it's a biological fungicide. It's a bacillus-based fungicide, so which are bacterium that colonize uh, on the leaf surface, helping to protect against pathogens. The great thing about Seraphil is that it can sort of complement your chemistry-based programs as also uh, be offered in organic-based programs with so much, many new uh, changes to labels and MRL restrictions and, um, you know, re-entry intervals of products changing. I think it's, it will become um, necessary for us to start adding different biological options or other options as tank mixes or into our programs so we can help with resistance management. So that's kind of where Seraphil comes in. Um, and, uh, and why I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about sort of how it works and, and why it's important. So as I said, we have a large label expansion. We started with grapes, but now we'll include carrots, peppers, potatoes, tomatoes, true wheat, herbit, um, lettuce, and most of the berry fruits. The uh, other thing that changed on our label is that we did have only a 16 month um, storage duration, but now we've in, increased that to 36 months, so three-year storage, which helps a lot um, with uh, anyone that's keeping keeping this product or can't use it for the just that year. So this is a biological, so um, for the label, I didn't list all of the diseases, but there is a number of diseases that will be on the label. All of them will be suppression, just the way uh, bacillus products work. Um, so you have to be aware of that. That's why it does make a good sort of tank mix partner to add to, um, you know, your resistance management. And it can be used on its own, uh, but you have to especially make sure that you are applying it before the disease is present. So I'll explain that a bit around seraphil and modes of action. Um, with the bacterial product, the interesting thing about it is actually has a lot of different modes of action because what it does is it lands on the leaf, 
it colonizes, so it creates sort of a physical barrier. And then it's taking up all the nutrients, so it offers nutrient competition. So if another pathogen comes along, it doesn't have any space or nutrients to sort of develop because that seraphil spore is already there. But it also creates uh, metabolites. Metabolites are what it uses to sort of communicate between cells. So these spores will create these metabolites that will actually attack pathogens, um, which is all, uh, kind of an interesting um, way for it to protect itself. It almost creates this uh, zone of exclusion or exclusion around it, so it doesn't allow anything else in by attacking these pathogens. And you can see in these pictures, you'll have a healthy powdery mildew cell here, and then um, the metabolites from the seraphil spores will actually start to attack and break down the cell walls, and will kill those fungicides or kill those powdery mildew pathogens. So another uh, sort of when looking, if you're using biologicals for the first time, one thing that's a little different is the um, way that you look at the label. So they're not just, they don't just give you a rate, they kind of give you a number of spores. So what the, those, it'll give CFUs per gram, which is colony forming units. What that means is the number of live spores. So you wanna make sure when you're using a biological that you have as many live spores packed into one gram so that they can they can colonize properly to give you the best control possible. And so that's just, uh, and the great thing about Seraphil is we've tried to perfect that as much as we can by offering the most amount of billion, number of billions of spores per gram. Uh, the next kind of interesting thing is when you think, because this is a bacillus, uh, you think that maybe using a lot of fungicides would actually harm it. But what we found in our testing was it actually makes them work a little better depending on the fungicide you're using. So most of our systemic fungicides, especially group sevens, we found when they were tank mixed with Seraphil, you had an increase in spore count. So Seraphil applied on its own on the left here. Uh, this is the sort of red spots or the uh, reddish pink spots are kind of the spores starting to colonize and increasing and spreading over the leaf. But when, when it was mixed with Cantus or Pristine, they kind of were exploded in numbers. Like they were given a bit of a boost and felt they needed to increase their numbers even faster. So it meant that you're covering more of the leaf surface, you're colonizing better, there's more metabolites to affect. So what we did then was uh, take a look at what is compatible with Seraphil, uh, safe to use. Um, and we found that there was a huge number of products that were completely safe to use with Seraphil, wasn't going to kill the spores when you applied it, including most of your systemic fungicides, coppers, uh, captain was okay, um, other insecticides and things like that. So this is a big list. You certainly don't have to memorize all of it. Uh, the important one actually was the products that will uh, kill the bacillus spores. So if you're using a Bravo, Mancozeb, um, Metaram product, anything like that, they should not be tank mixed with Seraphil and they should be used sort of within seven, kind of allow seven days so that they're not harming those spores when used. Um, but other than that, most of the, your, you know, standard systemic functions. Okay, so that was my quick overview of Seraphil. I'm just going to take a minute to review Sevia uh, now, just this one slide, and then I will wrap up. So Sevia was registered this past year um, for all of these crops that you can see for um, plum fruit, grapes, potatoes, stone fruit, sugar beets, peanuts, and tree nuts. So specifically for potatoes, uh, just this fall, we had a label expansion to include suppression of black dot and brown spot. So that is new for Sevia uh, this year. And also we received MRLs. Um, so because this is used in potatoes all across the country, um, we, it's important to have established MRLs in all of our sort of import, import export countries. So we've uh, received all MRLs for Sevia this year as well, which is exciting. 
Um, so that's kind of the update on Sevia. Uh, we are looking at also expanding this label to include include some other vegetable crops. So kind of stay tuned to that the next couple of years, and we should see more from Sevia. Um, other than that, uh, thanks to Lakeside for having me, and thanks for everybody hopefully staying awake and still listening. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Don't see any in chat. Yeah, there's one in the chat, yep. Great Home. Okay. So is, is the first product much different than Pristine as well? How long will Seraphil last on plant leaves? Will it translocate to new growth or will you need to reapply as new growth emerges? Uh, so I'll answer the first one. Um, so Pristine and Marivon uh, are very similar. They both have the same group 11. Marivon is a liquid, whereas Pristine is a dry. Uh, Marivon also has a different group 7, so sort of our kind of that next generation upgrade group 7 from Boscolid. Pristine has Boscolid. Uh, Marivon has Zemium. Uh, so so they are similar as far as they both have the same groups. They have very similar um, diseases that they covered on. Marivon's kind of just like the upgrade. Um, so I could go into more detail, but if you have questions specifically around crop and stuff like that, I can maybe help you out, but they are similar. And then, so for Seraphil, um, it tip. Uh, it will last anywhere from seven to 10 days on the leaf, but that can really depend on weather conditions. So just like um, your pathogens, they tend to like moisture and not extreme heat and things like that. So if it's very dry and, and very hot, then they won't last as long, um, you know, if there was a bit of humidity. And it's kind of weather dependent. Um, they, we usually recommend they should be reapplied every seven days, uh, five to seven days, depending again on the on the weather. Uh, they, it's they probably won't. They could colonize on new growth a little bit, but not a lot, just because you're probably going to want to reapply anyways every five to seven days. So I wouldn't rely on. All right, awesome. I think that's it for questions. I don't see any more in there. So if anyone else has questions, they can email Anne or I can forward it on to you, Anne. Yep, sounds great. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. All right. So last but not least, we have our very own Friedhelm Hoffman talking. I've been lucky enough to work along with Friedhelm uh, doing tissue sampling and sap sampling with uh, his fertigation program. Um, he's kind of the fertility expert of Lakeside. Uh, <laughs> don't roll your eyes. <laughs> All right, Friedhelm, I'll don't hand it to you. Here, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, thank you uh, for that introduction, <laughs> Nicole. Um, so, uh, I chose a new theme, increase plant health and decrease diseases. Talking about plant health, that's a big area and there's no way that I would cover it in the next 20 minutes, everything. But I wanted to um, uh, bring it up and start to talk about it because I think it is very important. Um, especially when we look at all these diseases that are uh, out there, <clears throat> we can do some other things. Some you will recognize, some you will say, oh, well, that's new. Uh, so let's have a look at that. So why talking about plant health directly? Sometimes uh, growing practice show that there are not only two, three, four, five, or 10 things to know about growing, but 
so many more and it it can be overwhelming uh, especially if you have to look after all the others and the uh, things in the production as well very well aware of that and I'm trying to convey that from my own experience when I grew the last 25 30 years <clears throat> and now in the last four years I had uh, the um, opportunity to observe and to work with other growers on uh, various crops and um, it's a quite a good experience um, so I want to share a little bit of that. Um, and of course, reflecting as what we grow is a very important thing. And sometimes certain things that for, are forgotten. And um, what are the plant body needs? That's important to be happy. Uh, a plant is as complex as we humans are. I'm making that bold statement. <clears throat> I can be criticized for that, of course, a plant is not human, but, uh, or vice versa, but um, it has a lot in common, what they don't like and what we don't like, right? So we need to always think about the happy factor of the plant. And it makes a difference <clears throat> to know more and get results because there is potential. Uh, plant health is all about balance so it's never about one thing there is no silver bullet a lot of growers come to me and say oh what well, do me this and they think this is the silver bullet no it's a whole variety uh, of things that need in for your balance of the plant in order to grow so what is plant health and the management of it um, i'm stealing a um, quote from James Cook from Washington State University who says plant health and management is the science of practice of understanding and overcoming the succession of biotic and abiotic factors that limit plants from achieving their full genetic potential and therefore limit fruit yield and quality achieving the full genetic potential so we buy an expensive plant and now we need our seed and now we need to see what we can do for a that we actually use what's all there and not expose it to um, a lot of risks. So plant health and the management of it is a wide field, as I said, and the presentation um, shows <clears throat> the present takes some of the factors, not all of it. There's no way out of this wide field for our practical growing of crops. That's what I'm trying to do. So we have to, uh, I'm, I'm putting that up because um, it comes from, of course, from our organic farmers or our organic farmers know much more about that because they live and breathe that uh, plant health. And we can learn something from them without becoming an organic farmer, we conventional people, um, farmers. Um, and so when you listen to the um, uh, products and you read the labels, of uh, biostimulants, then you will go come to this expressions, uh, definitions. So biotic stress for a plant is <coughs> um, fungus, um, viruses, and we just heard all about it, and then of course insects as well. And that can be on the top of the plant, and it can be of course in the root of the plant. And um, the plant defends itself with hormones and uh, that hormones can only work when the plant is really healthy. And some of the hormones we can also give, um, of course, or we can apply. And then there's abiotic stress, that's the outside impact, like the heat, drought, drought um, the cold, uh, the saltiness, because we are with it uh, has to do with fertilizing, of course, a very important part that we sometimes forget. Um, we have too wet flooding and metals if we keep, uh, for example, too much human waste. Uh, some use that and we enrich the ground also with metals. Um, that can be over time and it's too much dangerous, especially if the pH will drop a little bit. <clears throat> um, 
And so that's all the prior, the, the biotic, uh, abiotic things are the ones that the plant uh, needs for development, like photosynthesis and so on. Anyways, we go on. Um, I want to now talk about the impacts on health, a uh, plant health. So first of all, is the soil type, sand, loam, silt, clay, and I add muck, muck here, and um, everything in between, of course, right? So that's uh, very important now that we reflect on what soil type we have. And then the soil health. The soil health is basically also the plant health. Soil is our most uh, important investment in agriculture. <clears throat> not the machinery, the soil. So we have physical, chemical, and biological. And we need to be aware of that, what that is, uh, that builds that soil health. So I tried to make that in the one side in a science form and in a practical form uh, to explain. So there's a physical, uh, which is the soil structure, the density and texture, there's the biological organic matter organisms, bacteria, viruses, fungus, and so on. Um, that lists are not, um, they are not complete necessarily. And the chemical uh, impacts like the pH, the CEC, the, um, the nutrients there, the salinity as we already said, and the calcium carbon and sulfate uh, which we regulate a little bit our pH with. Uh, on a practical side, um, on the physical, we have impact through tillage, also compaction, and drainage. Drainage is very important, uh, how our physical appearance can be, but of course the tillage tools too. On the biological side, we have trash and manure that we can work in. Uh, to the ground, cover crops, a uh, very important part, rotational, and we'll come to that in a minute, and intro of biostimulus, which is a new trend, and um, it comes from the organic side, and um, it is worth to look at it. And then the chemical, the fertilizing, what we're fertilizing, how much we lime, the types of fertilizers, and especially the quantity. So I want to uh, have a word about rotation. Rotation, uh, we heard that today already a couple times. And the rotation is, I see that a lot now out there that farmers, producers get caught up with that. And it's not happening over the first time that you violated the rotation of four years or whatever the years are per crop. Uh, sometimes four years is not enough, depending on your soil again and your situation. We expand our production and suddenly we don't have enough grounds. We cannot just easily um, um, rent them. And rental ground has its own issues then, right? Um, sometimes it's not that easy. We can also not necessarily buy ground easily because it is not cheap. So, and then there's the weather and so on. And um, we need to uh, be aware of it, that that causes a lot of our issues. We are our own worst enemy. And how many years in between are enough? Yeah, I get that question often to me. And um, uh, there's a lot of numbers out there, but every operation and microclimate and whatever, whatnot, and your soil, type is um, makes that decision right and what it does when we have two an accumulation of diseases um, bacterium and fungus especially in there uh, in the ground it pushes out from us from a proactive proactive approach of farming into a reactive um, um, place where we then, oh, now we need a chemical, oh, now we need this and whatever, what we try. And suddenly the higher chemical input uh, also shows that there's less efficiencies, right? Because the only is good as we are growing in 
this case, right? Uh, fumigating is, of course, one way to do it. There are different fumigations out there. But always keep in mind when you fumigate, we also kill all the good stuff in there too. Uh, so yes, I uh, did fumigating a lot and that helps quite a bit. It does help, right? So it is uh, one thing that we can consider, but it's three or four hundred dollars an acre to do, right? So don't forget that. So when we then know what soil we're growing in, we need to know also what kind of root do we have, right? Uh, root is everything. We, we, we like to look at the top of the plant too much and not what's underneath, right? We need to take the shovel or the spade or whatever and dig down. And you see on the right-hand side, uh, one of our garlic growers, he took the time and digged down on his ground and look what wonderful root uh, he came up with, right? Wow, um, that's, I don't know how many inches that is, I didn't measure it, but it's probably eight inches or something like that. So never thought a, um, a garlic plant has this kind of root, but it does. So that's a good sign. Um, because that's the only way how you can actually make a crop uh, really grown. So now we have top roots, we have fibrous roots, and uh, we have the fleshy top root, which is a sugar beet or a rutabaga or a red beet or whatever, right? <clears throat> and the fibrous roots are very important. Here it is on the wheat. This is in centimeters, by the way. Um, how deep they go, that's 30 centimeters, right? And look how beautiful that uh, roots are. So we need to make sure that we know what kind of roots and that we have the environment for it. Uh, this is a cabbage root, I see, I've shown that before in my presentations. Um, now both are uh, well developed as for a cabbage. Uh, well, is planted and, and grows for six, eight weeks and uh, or whatever, and then gets harvested. Um, this one uh, on the right side is um, uh, not fertigated, and the left one is fertigated. You can see a little bit of difference there uh, because see the hair roots are very important. The top roots or the bigger roots take the water up, but the um, Nutrients uh, are taken up by uh, the um, uh, hair roots, mostly. And here you can see this is uh, corn, just for uh, our beloved corn. Uh, on the one side, it is fertigated, and the other one not. You see what the difference that is. Uh, just wanted to show that. Uh, so that has a big impact on the health, right? Ensuring how to grow a strong root and keep it that way. Sometimes we start very well out, but we don't look afterwards so much at it. So first, when we choose our crops, we need the genetic. We need to know what the genetics are. Uh, the, the right seed and the variety. We can't go cheap there. If the genetics already are questionable, then yes, we will have uh, some other problems uh, already programmed. And then the planting time, seeding time, whatever, is a very important one. Don't compromise because you have a lot to do. Um, it needs some patience, right? Um, I see very often that uh, some jumped the gun and went too early and then paid the price afterwards, right? Because the plant is damaged or had some uh, difficult times. Tillage, we can talk about a lot about that. Um, seed bed and planting beds, so important uh, that you get the right uh, tillage done, pending on your ground, of course. I mean, I was lucky to work in operation that we had three different tools, or four actually, uh, and pending on the spring, how it worked out, we could choose the tool, right? That is right. Uh, so that's a very critical part. And of course, our starter fertilizer that we put in there, 
Um, I'm not going further deeper into it, but if you want to talk about that, we can do that at any time. And then keep it moist. Um, make sure that when you plant and you have the opportunity at least, make sure you get it right away and uh, 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 wet in the area and um, get an irrigation cycle in. I know some plant and then the irrigation comes later, right? Uh, you have to just know what you do in that case that you put enough water in, and if that's before rain, that's perfect actually, right? But it is very important that that seedling, that little bit of water that you give in the planting is usually not enough to really uh, get the full potential. <clears throat> and then of course, fertilizer frequently, that's important. And the oxygen levels are essential. If there's no oxygen for the root, a very difficult part to even uh, think about to grow or it will limit your potential quite a bit. So if you have a big rain, a six inch rain or a three inch rain or whatever event, and you can uh, you have a tough time afterwards going in with a tool, uh, very difficult if it's sealed up on top, right? And here just for, that's one of the tillage tools um, maybe not in our area to use it or Rome beast. <laughs> I had to put that in there. That was in California, they use it, but they have also 30 feet of topsoil, right? So I had to put that in there. Unbelievable when I saw that. What do you do with that? Um, that's in California, by the way, too. So they put everything in bed, even they have topsoil coming out of the area. Uh, they still put things on bed even uh, then in order to give that root a good um, uh, oxygen and good, um, so they put everything on there on beds. Very interesting, not just for flooding necessarily, no, um, but uh, for uh, uh, just a better growing. And of course, um, this is, um, here in Ontario, that's tomatoes. You can put them on uh, beds. That's all my tomatoes. Um, very important that the root, you can control your root a little bit better. Or here in peppers as well in beds with plastic. It's so important to control that root. And it's so much better when you put it in beds. If you have the opportunity, it's just, an, just a uh, possibility. And then there's the nutrient household that has an impact on plant health. Um, and there's the good, good old German barrel from Mr. Liebig, Justus Liebig from 150 years ago, um, when he said the limiting factor of one nutrient to all others. So the balance is the key, right? So that barrel we never ever can forget, and you will see that from me a hundred times. So, but now coming from the old ways, we need to understand what our nutrients are that a plant needs during their growing cycle. So I hope my arrow is big enough. Um, here down here, there is the growing stages with the numbers on it, and that could vary from region to region or from variety a little bit. But um, this is tomatoes based on 45 tons, um, what they need, right? Uh, so this one here is, by the way, the, um, I don't show here. Oh yeah, up here. That's the um, potassium. And what I want to show here is, um, what I want to show here is, um, when we fertilize and we fertilize across here and that line, or when we have, this is, this is what it needs in the ground, that is combined, right? Uh, so when you have the soil and what you fertilize and you fertilize across here or even down here, it doesn't matter. You miss the opportunity, the potential, because that plant and that fruit set and that 30 days will starve because you don't have, you fertilized only so much, right? 
so that's a very one, important one that we are fertilizing by growing stage as much as we can. If we don't, we lose a lot of potential um, because the plant is stressed, even if it doesn't show, right? It still does well, maybe, but um, not, not that well that it could be, right? So that's uh, because there is stress on the plant. So you have to feed it accordingly. So when you're hungry and you're 15 years old and you get just cut off, you're just not getting enough food for growth, right? No, you do have to eat here. Um, very important. But not here and not here, because if you give too much up front, then you are stressing the plant again because uh, the nutrients compete to each other. So that's 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 the problem that we did traditionally. Of course, we put load the whole thing up. Well, not necessarily always the best thing. See, here's our beloved corn again. I wanted to show that, of course. Uh, same thing. You have to fertilize in this area and then again on the end. Nobody talks about that in the corn industry, right? <clears throat> because you have not the opportunity so easily, right? Um, here, this is the peppers. Well, you have the first cycle, wonderful, and then you're, you're, you're going down and your second harvest will not make it, right? Uh, look at that, how much they need in the second cycle in order to get that done. Um, then the cucumbers, completely different one. Here we want to sustain, we, we want to go up and we have to sustain this straight lines because the way how they grow, they just grow all the same. There's always flowering, always fruiting and growth, right? And so we have to keep the levels balanced. And here we have tissue or sap samples. That's an onion grow, uh, 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 growing stage, right? Um, there's different stages here. Uh, I didn't put them in very well. Anyway, so that, when we do that, then we have on a later stage when it fruits, we don't have a brown leaf, we have nothing, right? Uh, this Roma tomatoes there, that was uh, mid end of August, right? Unbelievable how healthy they can look. And here, this is watermelon leaves um, in August, usually they die off. Yes, you had a chemical application too to protect, but the chemicals only work because you had a healthy crop. And now it protects really what you uh, uh, grow. So that's what we want to see, right? So we should never forget that the fertilizer uptake from our granules are relative low. And these numbers are no absolute numbers, right? Uh, but you always need to know that the granular is um, not always available, especially because they are not moving very fast. Look at the phosphorus. Uh, so when you take other means with site dressing or fertigation or whatever, then you have a much higher, because usually you also use soluble fertilizer. And of course, follow the four R's, not because just of the environmental point of view, but the right source and the right time and the right rate and the right place is essential in order to have a healthy plant. Too much is not good and too less for sure, not either. And here is uh, just very quick. Um, this is how we can see what's going on. Are we on the right track or not? This here is a sap sample, a part of it at least. <laughs> The list is much longer where so you can see the total sugars, where you are, the pH in the plant. It's basically a blood sample out, right out of your, out of your um, plant. And it's like, you see in this case here, this is tomatoes actually. It's a sap sample from fruiting and the fruit growth. Um, so that has lots of pot uh, potassium too much and it hinders the calcium right here, right? So we have to, a little bit slower with the potassium here uh, in order to give the calcium a chance or you will have a uh, bottom rot or something like that right this is just an example uh, how you can read this uh, needs a little bit expertise uh, here's the normal tissue samples that looks a little bit uh, tissue sample is whatever you did what's digested through the plant already and that's what we're looking at so it's a little bit past that's maybe already two weeks ago 
this was in cucumbers, right? So here there's a little bit K missing, uh, potassium missing, and we have to make sure we get our nitrogen up. Um, just that we are very balanced here for cucumbers. And then uh, we can do additional actions. So we can do a Foley application where needed. Um, we can strengthen the plane with that. Uh, we can do a fungicide application that will complement a healthy plant with being protected. It's like a vaccine a little bit, right? In some um, places. Um, pretty sure my chemical reps will be all over me when I say that. Uh, the insecticide uh, mostly is a reactive thing uh, as an in, uh, integrated pest management. That's what we should go for. In most cases, not all of them, it can also be preventive, of course. Um, and the last slide here is just a summary of the benefit from good hand to plant health is that we have crop evenness and a better cons consistency. It's quite significant. Um, we have less disease pressure, what we want. Um, proactive crop maintenance. I think that's really important that we are thinking about what that entails. Um, and so, as I already said, the chemical applications actually protecting. And here, there's the economics, long-term costs, the yield increase that you get, the food quality improvement especially. And we shouldn't forget the efficiency when it comes to uh, uh, labor, right? When you have a, a fruit that is consistent, it's, it, it may be depending on the crop, it saves you a pass or um, um, makes your labor much more efficient. Lots to say on that, anyways, but that's it for today. And if you have any questions directly now or later, you can do that. Back to you, Nicole. I don't see any questions in the chat box. 